Hello and welcome back. In the first part of this series, we resurrected the first of our two MMD1s, an 8-bit microcomputer trainer based on the then brand new Intel 8080 chip. The MMD1, originally called the DynaMicro and designed by John Titus of Mark 8 fame, was distributed by ENL, my favorite maker of vintage breadboard systems. And as you would expect, the MMD1 features a breadboard too. It's there for you to discover digital logic design and how to interface it with the newfangled Intel microcomputer chip. There were many educative books written about the MMD1 and guiding you through programming and breadboarding experiments, most famously the bug books 5 and 6, written by the very team that developed the MMD1. One of the basic experiments is the classic combination of a 7447 BCD-7 segment decoder TTL chip, a few resistors, and a 7 segment LED display. All that to show a glorious red glowing digit. It works, but it is a bit cumbersome, often leading to unsightly breadboard spaghetti. However, this other book suggested to use the vintage HP 5082-7300 LED display instead, which HP called an intelligent display. It was available in 1976 and must have cost a fortune back then, but the HP display was a far more elegant solution. It contained the 7-segment decoder and the LED current driver chip within the display and it even had a memory latch and a blanking pin. And see those little dots? Ooh, adorable! And as luck would have it, I have several of the vintage 5082-7340s in my collection. The even better version that can also decode hexadecimal. It would save so much room over the classic design that I could put a whole bunch of them on the breadboard. So let's take a breather and do some relaxing breadboarding to pimp up our newly restored MMD1. Okay, we are finally ready to do some breadboarding and uh, mount our beautiful indicators. And these are HP 5082-7340. And they are just gorgeous. So I breadboarded one on, on an HP breadboard, of course, right here power in red and then ground in white and then there are six inputs so first you have all your bits the lower order bit gets into a zero then the next one is the two then this one is the four and this one is the eight nine and it's an hexadecimal so it can do uh, ten is a b c d e and F. The yellow one is just blanking. And this one is the latch. This thing has memory. You can put three. Then you can latch it. And then you can change to something else. And then you unlatch it. And it's become a C. And you make an F. And while it's unlatched, it will just follow and pass through. And while it's latched, you change to something else. So here is how we are going to wire our MMD1 breadboard. Note that we don't want to use the left part where the helpful labels are. The processor's signals are directly wired there. Not to worry, we'll use that section later. I'll put three digits on the right for the data. Since my HP 7340s can display hexadecimal, I really only need two. But the whole machine is in octal, the keyboard entry is in octal, the book examples are in octal, and the 8080 machine codes are also logically broken down along octal boundaries. So octal it is, and we need three digits to represent eight bits. Next, I'll put three more displays for the eight lower bits of addresses. For the higher address bits, I decided to put only one digit. Right now, we don't have memory past 3.000 anyhow. That will also leave some space for more breadboarding tomfoolery later. If we ever add more memory above 7.000, above the 2 kilobytes boundary, we'll simply read the higher address bits on the original LEDs. As we've just seen, the HP displays are really IC, so we need to pair them with ground and plus 5 volts. We do that for all the digits. 
The MMD1 already latches the outputs for us, so we ground the latch pin as we don't need that feature. Same for all the digits. Next, we need to wire the outputs going to our LEDs to our new displays. If you look closely at the LED section, you'll see that there is a little wire connector below every LED just for that purpose. So it's going to be super simple. We wire bit 0 to the A input of the HP chip, bit 1 to B, bit 2 to C. At which point we have wired our first octal digit, so we simply ground input D. The digit will count in octal from 0 to 7 only. Rinse and repeat for the second digit. The third digit is just slightly different, we only have two LEDs left, so we wire A and B and we will ground both C and D this time. So this digit only counts up to 3, which is how octal rolls. Remember that 255, or FF in hex, is 377 in octal. That completes the wiring of the data field. The lower 8 bits of the address field is done exactly the same way. For the higher address field, we only wire the three first LEDs to our single digit, which will count up to 7. And that's it! <laughs> this is an easy episode. All is left to do is watch a couple episodes of Ben Eater videos to give us enough courage to cut all the wires. For those that don't know, Ben wired up an entire 6502 computer on a breadboard. Sorry, I didn't get the ASMR footage of the measuring, cutting and bending the wires. I kept those happy moments for myself. You'll have to watch other channels for that. Oh, this Albin JD guy is a breadboarding god. I will never use a PCB again. Sadly, I am no Albin JD, however, it didn't look too bad when it was all done. Good enough for Curious Me. And. I have wired seven of those indicators. So if you go like this, boom, I do reset. Oh, it's still, that's, I bet you that's still a clock problem. Well, uh, apart from the nice zeros, yeah, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Anyhow, here we have the address is block two, which is the lower memory here. Uh, address 00 and it reads 140. If I want to go to address 000, I enter 0 and I put it in the high. It went here, so that's 0. I have only wired one fold of this because I just don't have enough memory, so this is just the, the block selection. And we are now in the first ROM. If I put a 1, oops, 0, 1 into the high register, now it's my one. Now I am in that ROM. If I put a two, now I am in that RAM. And if I put a three, three high, now obviously I am in that guy. And if I put a four, I am going to run out of memory. Four high, and then I have three seven sevens, right? So it's, it is no more memory. Past that, we have gone above our 1k of promised memory. Uh, however, uh, not all is well. If I now go to bank 2, 0002 high, and I should now be in those two chips. I try to put 000 in it, and then I go back to see what I did. And I have a bit 2 that's on. Go to the next one, uh, store 0, 0, and then go back to it. And same thing, it's the bit 2 got sticky here. And if I step through it, we'll see that the bit 1 is always on. So I think we have a problem with the memory bank 2. Should be easy to check if I swap those two chips, the fold should move along. Turn it off, take the chip off. Okay, try again, reset. Let's put all zeros in, store, 
look back and sure enough my bits are good here and they are bad here so the fault moved with the chips uh, so I bet you that chip is no good so I've brought out the retro chip tester pro which I think can check the Intel 8111 there would be the uncommon rams the it's actually uh, two one one ones the eight one 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 is the original one and then the two one 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 is the same thing but it's faster two one 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 this one i think is a good one the four bits that were fine okay testing test passed all right so it's a good one and that's the one i put it upside down like a dead bug because i think it's dead Okay, and select. And it failed pre-test, which I suppose it's checking that it has no shorts or something like that. So this one is very, very, very dead. It must consume too much current. So this one is dead. Uh, fortunately, we have two MMD ones. So over here, we have the very crusty MMD one. Oh. Since this chip has no dot on it, I'll, I'll try that guy. And it's a good chip. Okay. So we'll replace it with that one and then try to find a replacement for the one that's dead. And that's the one we stole from the crusty MMD1. Different manufacturer. This is Signetex and this is NEC. And you see, of course, the, the Japanese making inroads uh, into memory fairly early and then essentially killing Intel's businesses. Intel's business. Um, okay, so let's see. Let's load a zero store and go back to it. And it's a zero. A 377 store. Go back to it. And it's a 377, so the, 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 the memory chip is good. So we can step through memory. Works fine. I'm going to run out of memory right here. Yep, no more memory. Okay, I think we have a functional MMD1, so now we go and program stuff on it. So I'm going to follow the example from the book. It's going to be a lot easier now that I have a numerical display. So I start with... 03, put it in my high register, so here I am, and I need to go to 3000, and now we go 036. zero load and run and it's not doing a thing no go and it's not doing a thing either oh there we go I was a lot of paddling to get just this but of course I would have taught you a lot about uh, how computers are programmed in, in machine language and how to use the um, 8080, so that's the whole point of this. So it's getting more Christmassy by the minute, but this is the same program ran with two different start bytes. That's it for this short intermezzo to rest our brain cells. Nevertheless, adding glorious HP retro displays made it much more user-friendly and allowed us to spot a bad memory chip right away. Next, we will restore our other very crusty MMD1, then we'll get really serious about hacking them some more. See you in the next episode!